Tom, you're all right. You and I have a good relationship. But come on, you really mean to tell me you can help a player focus under pressure? If you do work with a performance psychologist in in a, an elite sport, for example, there's this myth that you have some sort of weakness. Before this episode starts, I have a small favor I need to ask you. Since the channel started, over 90% of those that have watched have not subscribed. So if you liked any of my podcast episodes or any of the content on this channel, please hit the subscribe button down below. It helps the channel grow. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests. Thank you and enjoy this episode. So Tom Bates, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. My first question is, is why is psychology important? Oh, well, that's a great first question. Um, <laughs> and, you know, one over the years that I've um, had the privilege to be challenged to <laughs> answer in many uh, different performance contexts. Um, uh, psychology, obviously, is is it's one of those things that I think, like any discipline, when it's when it's properly understood and fully integrated, we can understand that it's central to performance success. So performance psychology, loosely defined in my working environment, is um, you know, the way that we think affects the way that we feel. And the way that we feel directs and defines behavior, but in a sporting environment, performance. So really, it's understanding that the thoughts that we have impact our emotional state. And that emotional state whether I'm crossing the white line or entering into the ring or getting down onto the track or jumping off the blocks into the pool or whatever arena we find ourselves in is central to the process of success. So the great phrase that exists goes something like, like this, the mind is the athlete, the body simply the means to jump higher, run faster, punch harder, go quicker. The mind is the athlete. And so in many ways, we discover on the journey that psychology is not this something that is external to us that can help at times, but it's actually central to the process of getting the very best from ourselves when it matters under you know conditions of, of pressure in, in the arena, in the moment. If I was to bring you back to when you started developing your knowledge around mindset, um, well-being, uh, preparation in terms of uh, mental support. Um, where did it begin? And what was the uh, little bit of light bulb moment that, that intrinsically, you, intrinsically drove you towards this subject area? That's a really great question, Christy, because I think if I'm honest, um, uh, I, I started to build an awareness of, although I didn't know what it was called, when I was a, a player, 14, 15 years of age, uh, playing here in Cambridge, which is where I'm from, Cambridge United Youth Development Setup. And I was a player that, that lacked the, the talent required to make it into the senior realms. Um, but I had a, a, what I thought was a really good attitude. And then I was surrounded by players on my team that were much more talented than I was, uh, much better than I was, but didn't necessarily maximize their talent because of their attitude or their approach their mental approach if you if we can say towards their training and performance so at a very very early age I started to become aware that you know mindset is very very important I wonder if players with more talent than I who could improve their attitudes and mental focus could perform at a higher level and although I didn't know it at the time I probably could have dealt with working with uh, a sports psychologist in those early days because I struggled in many ways. I struggled to um, perform when it mattered. I became very anxious in my performances, even though if we're talking about a low level, you know, crowd, 250 people, whatever. But I would definitely uh, work myself up into an emotional state that was certainly less than optimal. So I'm uh, looking back now, I would have absolutely loved to have worked with uh, a performance psychologist to help me prepare and perform at my best. And then that that early sort of inner awareness grew into a growing curiosity to go and study um, in PE. And I did my A-levels here in Cambridge at Long Road. And that's where I sort of, for the first time, became aware of sports psychology as a discipline. And so I was absolutely delighted to be able to, you know, pursue that curiosity and combine what was then coaching uh, with sports psychology. Well, why would you think there's a limitation 
Tom, it's it's kind of the the million dollar question, really. You you reflected back on your your youthhood and your your experiences uh, uh, as a as an academy footballer, uh, and you mentioned that if you had maybe had the tools and the knowledge, it could have maybe influenced maybe the outcomes of your career. Why do you think there was a lack of awareness in psychology, and and why do you think it's only taken to recent times for us to really underpin it as a discipline and and understand it and and understand how it actually does impact performance i think i think um we evolved don't we in many ways over time in all disciplines not just in psychology or sports psychology but i remember in the early days um during my placement year in the third of four years at bournemouth university i had the opportunity to work at afc bournemouth and i was a qualified coach so they could pay me for working with the under nines and under tens a job that i absolutely loved they were like little sponges and it was my introduction to coaching um, so I qualified as a coach first and, you know, I was trying to explain to them, you know, but I also can do sports psychology. I also know a little bit about some of these strategies and processes. And the response was, well, yeah, but we can't pay you for that. And all oh, secondly is what is that? <laughs> so our understanding of all different disciplines evolves over time. Um, and I think, to be honest, the only real limitation that exists is, the capacity for practitioners to articulate to 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 help coaches football clubs sporting organizations understand what it is and what it isn't and then within the realms of performance psychology sports psychology we've got different practitioners who operate in the clinical realms um psychiatry for example we have uh, you know personal therapists um and then we have sports psychologists educational psychologists performance psychologists so there's a realm there's a, a range of expertise across those different types of practitioners but to adjust the question i think probably the only limitation that exists is a collective understanding a of the importance and B uh, of what it is, it in inverted commas, you know, because there are a multitude of different services that are out there. But essentially, that's why I did my coaching badges and continued to get qualified as a coach because I needed to understand the challenges that coaches face. I'd understood, you know, the challenges that players face from my own experiences as a, a failed player, if you like, in the youth system. Um and as we've grown, I think we've developed our understanding of what of what the service is, what sports psychology is, and the benefits that it can bring. But the funny thing is, you know, that when you listen to managers speak in, in post-match conferences and even pre-match interviews, they and players and coaches, etc., they all speak and they all reference the importance of our attitude today. You know, we were committed, we were more focused. We were definitely more motivated. We were up for it. And we speak about those things as if they are uh, random occurrences. You know, and sometimes it's in the lap of the gods. So one of the one of the biggest developments that I've seen is that we understand performance psychology, the mental and emotional processes required to perform at our best are A, identifiable and B, with conscious effort can be improved. And so just like when you go into the gym, strength and conditioning, for example, sport in sports science and medicine, that's been accepted for a long, long time. But in the very, very early days, what was a strength and conditioning coach um, until we were able to articulate the science behind the, the work and the benefits and the outcomes that it can bring? And then I think probably because of the endorsement of high profile players that I've worked with and continue to work with, not just in football, but across different sports, I think that really helps too because it's authentic. It's a genuine, um, you know, endorsement of some of the work that has been done and is being done that makes a difference to performance. That's the biggest growth that I've seen. And in society, we see that too, right? We're becoming more evolved in understanding how psychology can help us. What do you think some of the challenges are within psychology today? If a, if a practitioner um, or a coach or a player is, is watching this and they were trying to pick out maybe some of the, the key themes that become a, a reoccurring challenge within elite sport, or it might not even be elite sport, Tom, it could be life in general. Uh, could, you, mm. could you kind of open up and, and kind of elaborate on some of those themes and, and um, what's apparent in today's society? Yeah, I think there's a general misconception 
Um, I'll share a brief story in a second, but there's a general misconception that you only really work with a performance psychologist if you have a problem, okay? And if you do work with a performance psychologist in in an elite sport, for example, there's this myth that you have some sort of weakness and you can't be seen to be weak in an elite environment that involves mental and emotional processes. If you have... You know, if you need to improve strength or speed or stamina, well, no, that's okay. That that can be worked on. But if you have, you know, a need to work on some mental and emotional processes, then for some reason we've associated that with a weakness. So I don't think that stigma has helped the development and progress of, of the role for the practitioner. But I remember my first day at Birmingham City Football Club. I'd just moved from Bournemouth on the south coast to the Midlands. Um, and it was club f- photography day. So I was walking across the indoor dome area and all the first team and academy players were brought in in kit. And I was very excited, as you can imagine. I just had the interview with the first team manager, Alex McLeish, and the academy director, who was then a guy called Terry Wesley. And, you know, I was so excited to be at the club. I thought this is going to be my run one shot at making this work. And everybody now understands the role of performance psychology. And I walked across the dome. And I was greeted by a head of recruitment who had been at the club for many, many years. Uh, I forget his name now, but he he met me and um, he said, oh, you're the new uh, performance psychologist. You've come to work with the academy. I said, yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. And I held up my hand like this and um, he didn't shake my hand. He just stood there and said, "Um, what a load of, well, bleep. Let's fill in the bleep, right? (laughs) (laughs) And left my hand uh, and walked away. And it was at that point that I realized, okay, so maybe not everyone in the organization understands, A, what it is that I do, and B, the uh, the importance of the role. So, so it was a funny um, first experience for me in a, in a new club, you can imagine, on my first day. So I had very quickly realized the need to simplify the role and the benefits that it can bring you know, quickly, because ultimately elite athletes players in general, coaches, managers are asking themselves the question, A, can I trust this person? B, do they know what they're talking about? And C, can they help me perform better? Are you going to make my performance better? And so we have to be prepared for those questions early on. And if we're not, then that level of um, trust and integration can quickly dwindle. So it was an early experience and a great first lesson for me. The micro politics of football, right? (laughs) (laughs) yeah there are a few (laughs) in terms of obviously the the discipline of psychology and um making people aware of what you do do you think maybe because if we compare you said strengthening conditioning and sports science that you can within those disciplines is a bit of a metric and you can kind of look at different statistics and data i mean it kind of gives you figures to to kind of make objective improvements do you think because of psychology because it's hard to measure because obviously it's around mindset and it's around, uh, you know, different attributes around um, preparation and all those other factors that are associated with psychology. Do you think that because it's a challenge to um, objectively measure its usefulness, that that's where maybe that opinion of is it effective comes into place? It's a really good question. And in fact, that the head of recruitment and I became the best of friends, you know, months later, because uh, what he was actually telling me was something very important. You know, it's, it's, and again, not just for performance or sports psychologists, but practitioners in all disciplines. It's very important that we understand when we go into organizations, um, we are, we are, it's a, kind of a responsibility to help the organization grow, learn and improve in their understanding of working practice as well. And the funny thing was that that head of recruitment believed very much in the importance of how to build confidence, how to increase self-belief in players and that mindset could be defining to performance. But what he was really saying is, um, how old are you? How do you really know what you think you know? I've been around the game for many, many years, been around the block a few times. And um, so that's important on lots of different reasons, for lots of different reasons on multiple different levels, because to assume that I know everything there is to know about the role is a big mistake. 
And then to assume that everybody has a, an aligned collective understanding of that is a second mistake. And then the other thing is that realizing that he isn't actually telling me he doesn't believe in it. He's questioning the capacity to improve these things. Uh, in other words, he would say something to me like, you know, Tom, you're all right. You know, you and I have a good relationship, but come on. You really mean to tell me you can help a player focus under pressure. You really mean to tell me that you can help a player improve their levels of confidence, uh, you know, if they've not been in the team for five games in a row. Or, and I would say to him, yeah, absolutely. So, in fact, I had a very conversation, a very good conversation with um, Steve Clark, who's a wonderful uh, coach, now manager of Scotland, the men's senior team. And uh, he would say to me, you know, Tom, all this psychology stuff, I'm not so sure about it. In some of those words may have been adapted. And uh, <laughs> he would say, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, Tom, about this psychology stuff. Um, and I say, well, OK, well, then can you tell me a little bit about Sir Kenny Dalglish and your time with him at Liverpool or Jose Mourinho at Chelsea or um, Sir Bobby Robson at Newcastle? And, you know, he would say things to me like, yeah, well, when you walked into the room, with Jose, he would just make you feel like winning was inevitable. He had such a presence. And he'd say, well, Sir Bobby would, um, he knew all the names of the girlfriends and wives and birthdays of the children. And he just felt so appreciated and cared and loved, you know, by this man. Connected to the culture that he set up, you know. And I, he would say, well, Sir Kenny Dalglish, he... Um, he was his level of focus and drive. He was just so committed and motivated and everybody just fed off of that energy. And I said, Steve, well, you, you know, you're using those words. It's the same. It's just the word psychology that, that we, that we mm -hmm. can't align on for whatever reason. So that's a very interesting sort of story to, and it was a great lesson for me too, to be able to speak the language of the culture of the environment, you know, to understand the demands that coaches face, but also to understand you've got to, we've got to get good at sense checking the environment, at responding to the emotional temperature, speak the language in the context of the culture, instead of just coming from an academic environment, you know, having uh, a lot of my friends qualified with firsts. I didn't, you know, I didn't spend my time as much as they did. And, committed to the academic side of study uh, because often occasions I was out coaching for free and trying to learn how to be a coach and working with players and teams and, you know, offering my services for, v for free just to get an understanding of what it felt like to be in the environment. And I think that's one of the big things that we've seen develop and grow as well, which is there's normally a big gap between what is being theoretically and academically studied and then what is being practically applied on the mm -hmm. front line in sporting environments. So we've sort of bridged the gap, if you like, through shared experience over time. And that's been one of the main reasons why the discipline has evolved um, over time, because we've got better at bridging that gap, you know. Is there any differences across um, other sports, Tom? You mentioned, well, we've looked at football from a range of examples. If we look at other sports that you might have had experiences in or, or other sports that you observed in terms of elite professionals as well as coaches, is there is there any differences um, within that? Because you mentioned the theory and applying theory to practice and how there might be a limitation with that crossover around culture and environment. Is there is there anything that we have to maybe look at different if we're working with individual uh, players or individual athletes within within individual sports in comparison to maybe team sports is a is a symmetry or is there is there differences i'm intrigued on that yeah so i think there are differences there are definite differences in the nature and dynamic of the culture and context and the way that athletes prepare and perform in individual sports to to team environments there's no doubt about that i mean when i when i left aston villa in what would it have been 2018 then as head of performance psychology and culture, I was working very much in a team-based environment, of course. Um, it was a time when we were searching to get back to the Premier League. Uh, but when I left, I then started to work in individual sports and at Olympic level. And I understood that there are, there are many differences, but the fundamental 
processes to get the best from ourselves is about self-awareness, understanding how we enter into the emotional states required to perform at our peak. And that doesn't change. So even within a team environment, the individual work that I would do one-to-one with players um, over the years has probably uh, enhanced in terms of the frequency of work within the team environment with the individual has has definitely become more prominent. Um, clearly, when I'm requiring on, when I'm, you know, when I am working with my teammates in a collective setup scenario, then I'm that's an interdependent situation, right? If uh, we're working in a formation, for example, in football or rugby, we're very much dependent upon each other and how to be aligned with a tactical game plan. But when you break it down, you realise that they have individual roles and responsibilities within that team system to perform at their best. And that's something that's very similar. So regardless of the context of that performance, when you when you really break it down, individuals have certain roles and responsibilities to be able to fulfill and perform at their best. So whether I'm in a team environment or whether I'm in an individual environment, I'm still ultimately responsible for my own level of performance. And that's something that is um, almost identical. Just referring back to your experiences within football, uh, and you mentioned culture, that was kind of a a key catalyst in in what you were saying. Um, Especially men's football, um, masculinity, I'm sure that has a massive impact on people opening up about their their mental well-being and mental health. Um, And the reason I say that is, you said that sometimes psychologists might be seen as that person that a player or coach might want to avoid because if they're seen in 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 conversation or seen approaching those people, it's 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 showing it's letting your guard down to some extent. Um, and I think within football and and especially men's football, there's that masculine environment where um, you mentioned traditional coaches and and kind of maybe how that aligns with uh, the the culture of a club and um, what it means to partake in football and everything that's maybe associated with its old previous working class values, et cetera. I'm intrigued on how you you break that stigma um, and how you develop a bit of more openness around psychology and um, create an environment where it's okay to speak to psychologists, whether that's maybe in a formal setting, but as well as an informal setting. I'm intrigued on how you, you work along those um, factors that influence behaviours and outlooks towards uh, mental well-being and, and improving that. Yeah, well, I think I think the reason that question is probably the most important question you've asked me so far is that it really points towards um, effective leadership within an organisation. I was working within Aston Villa, who had um, my line manager, who's a guy called Steve Round. He was the director of football. Um, and CEO Keith Wyness, they were two members of staff who were leading the club at that time and recognised the importance of of breaking down the stigma of this myth that it's a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's, It's the opposite. It's the biggest strength that one could ever display because we're not perfect. You know, it takes courage. It's a display of absolute strength to be courageous enough to attack the areas of self-improvement. And so great leaders understand that, that it's not a weakness. And they lead by example by prioritizing that as a service within the sporting organization. So let's take, for example, one of the most, if not the most successful sporting teams in history, the New Zealand All Blacks working with a guy called Gilbert Anoka, who was affectionately known as their mental skills coach, helped the New Zealand All Blacks to turn away, get through a lot of the adversity that they were facing and transform that into success over a period of three to four years by adopting mental skills training. Now, they might not have called it that at the time, but the principles still remain the same, that if it's possible to work on the body, our muscles physically, then why not the mental and emotional muscles that we need to perform? So the New Zealand All Blacks, I think you might have to do some research on this, Christy, but the New Zealand All Blacks are one of, if not the most successful sporting teams in history who fundamentally understood that it is possible 
to improve our mental muscles. And not only is it not only is it possible, but it's absolutely necessary if we want to be the very best that we can be. So players and the team and the head coach, he would they would work with Gilbert to maximize their performance. And I think I saw something the other day that I think Gilbert Anoka's gone to work with Chelsea uh, very recently. And once again, that's a that's an organization who understand that it's an absolute strength to work on the mind as well as the body. I'm sure you've probably watched the the uh, the Arsenal documentaries and the Tottenham Hotspur documentaries that have come out. And I think one thing that stood out for me in the Arsenal documentary was that transaction between staff members um, at the football club. So the coach, the performance coach, there was a transaction going on in terms of what the coach wanted the player to do and what the player needed to do. And there was kind of that, that transactional process there. But have you ever thought about that in terms of the environment where you have, have done your work just because of obviously those examples? But I think with those examples, it, it kind of shows that informal method and that relationship and that coach-athlete relationship or the coach-psychology shows relationship is significant but might need to, to kind of change to some extent to, to make people talk about their feelings and talk about the, the, the way that they uh, they are, you know, in, in that current state. Have, have you ever thought about that in, in, in your practice? Most definitely. And the reason I was so privileged and thankful to, to Aston Villa was that um, they recognised culture as part of the role. And not only was it part of the role, but it was central to this idea of every single person in our environment helps the team win on a Saturday, every single person. So whether you are the kit man or the chef or you're working behind the desk at reception, and normally those are the most important people that we have at our football club because they interact with the players on a human level. And that's the thing about this, the work, really, Christy. There's a great quote by Maya Angelo that goes like this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I love that because it reveals this sort of human quality, this authentic human quality that is absolutely necessary for our high performers to do well when it matters because it's understanding our people. It's understanding how they see the world. To be able to see the world through the eyes of our players as people first, player second, allows them to be who they really are. And if we want anybody in our football clubs, whatever role they play, to be successful and help the team, they have to be comfortable to be themselves. And all too often we are afraid. Fear is a big barrier that prevents people from being who they really are. Fear of judgment, fear of consequence. We all sort of, to a degree, wear masks when we're in, we're in organisations and we do that because we feel like we have to protect ourselves from, from not letting others see who we really are. But the great paradox of that, the joy of that is if we're prepared to be courageous enough to be seen for who we really are, then not only does our performance improve, but everything changes because we can optimally go about our days in every interaction without having to pretend, pretend to be something that we're not. And that includes any practitioner as well, by the way. So, it's important that, you know, in the role, we're able to be human beings. Uh, we all have human needs. And those human needs are not just nice to have needs. They are absolutely fundamental if I want to perform at my optimum in any job that I've got. So understanding the human being and the human needs is at the center of any healthy, high performing sporting organization. Interesting when you said masks. I don't know if you have to look had a look at the work of Irvine Goffman. He mentions that we're all actors on a stage and we put different personas on, different faces on. It kind of relates to, to what you said in in those elite environments. Yeah, it, it does because of course, you know, let's not pretend as well. There is a very um we're in the business. It's a results business. And I can understand how that would influence a culture because when there's something at stake and there's high rewards or high costs, then that has the potential to significantly influence how we are 
and who we are in those environments, what I'm suggesting is there's a better way. We can absolutely achieve results and be who we really are authentically with each other. And to my mind, the best organizations that I've worked in understand that very well and work towards improving that as part of what they do every single day. Your position and your your practice, I, I get the feeling that you're constantly working with athletes that are thinking ahead. So whether that's in in terms of the next game on the weekend or a competition, for example, you mentioned the Olympics, um, and it's always putting the mind in the future, in a future state. Is there anything that you kind of work with athletes to kind of make them more present to think about their feelings now? Because I can imagine the pressures and the anxieties that take place in elite sport. It's something that is going around someone's head that hasn't happened yet, or they're thinking about situations that might happen in a period of time, whether that's um, a short period of time or a long period of time. I'm intrigued on how you you try and bring a calmness towards that and let athletes think about the present moment. I'm sure meditations might creep into that as well. And not even athletes, Tom, it might be people that are in the business world that might be listening or watching this podcast and think I'm in positions where um, they're worried about their future or they, they contemplate certain things that might play out. Um, have you got any advice on that, on how to be a bit more present in, in everyday life? Yeah, absolutely. And and by the way, there's a wonderful book called Stillness Speaks by Eckhart Tolle. I'm not sure um, if we've mentioned it uh, in any other podcast, but Stillness Speaks by Eckhart Tolle. It's a book that really is uh, dedicated to helping people understand the power and importance of staying present, to be in this moment to be here, to be now, because the mind likes noise. <laughs> and there, are, when you're in a high-performance business, of course, we mentioned earlier, there is something at stake. But the truth is that this moment is all we really ever have, mm. right here and now. And in the book, Eckhart speaks about the illusions of both the past and the future, the illusion of consciousness. You know, the past exists in a memory in the here and now the future when it gets here will be in the here and now so really all we ever have is the now this moment in time so just one of a couple of examples really i would guess would say that um, something that can help is to be conscious and aware of my breathing to switch off from digital devices around me and to just place my energy and attention on the simple, natural process of my breathing. And if I can do that for just two to three minutes a day, and really it's a letting go of the noise and fears and distractions and cognitions that we have. That's one of the other things, right? Too much thinking equals slowly sinking. Too much thinking, slowly sinking. That otherwise known as paralysis through analysis. I can paralyze myself through analyzing things to the nth degree. And we know that elite performance is typified by a low level of thought, if any at all. Because when athletes are in the flow, they say it just happens naturally, effortlessly, automatic, fluently. It's just a feeling of complete euphoria. And my performance goes through the roof. So that's a state of non-thinking rather than overthinking. But Across to context, I think um, meditation, as you mentioned, is very can be very useful. I'd highly recommend it. Um, seek guidance and support, of course. There are lots of great apps out there at the minute that can also help with that. Journaling is another way that I'd highly recommend anybody listening to this. To It's a type of catharsis to release our thoughts out onto paper um, instead of keep them locked up inside of our heads. You know, when we journal and reflective the practice of gratitude is really so powerful to think about things that we are grateful for, not just in our occupations, in our jobs, but also in our lives, because it's once again an attempt to try to direct and channel our attention and energy on the things that I feel grateful for. And what I focus on, I feel, but what I focus on, I get more of. So if I'm thinking about three things at the start of my day, that I'm extremely thankful for. 
then instantaneously my emotional state changes towards that day. If I go to bed at night and before I sleep, I think about three things that I'm grateful for for the day. What I focus on, I feel. I change my emotional state. And oftentimes breathing is one of the most simple and it doesn't cost very much either. It's cost effective, mm -hmm. right? To be able to just bring my energy and attention to my breathing. But it can certainly help anchor me in this present moment. It's interesting how Eastern philosophies are so relevant to, to Western lifestyle in terms of um, mental health and um, factors around uh, relaxing the brain and, and being more present. Um, I think it's something that we all struggle with as a society in general. Would you agree with that? I think the speed of life, Christy, is, um, and also the digital influence. I see so much of that now. I was on the train uh, in London underground recently, last couple of weeks, and stepped on, and I was I was that alien type figure who wasn't on the phone and wanted to say hello and smile and say good morning <laughs> to people. And uh, some had earphones on, ironic that I'm using them here. Uh, and some, you know, were just staring down at their iPads or their iPhones. And, and I looked, I just did a quick check up and down the carriage. And I would say around 95% of people were tuned in to some sort of electronic device. And there are great things about technology, right? There are wonderful things. But certainly one of the changes that I've made is um, I recently bought myself a, a, a good old fashioned alarm clock with two hands and a bell. And uh, I've practiced the art of discipline by switching my phone to do not disturb when I go to sleep at night. And I set my alarm off of the the old alarm clock so that I'm not tempted to get on the phone and spend time absorbed in this electronic device, which is going to keep my brain active before I sleep. Right. Mm. There's a lot of great things, like I said, but certainly in terms of staying present, of interacting with each other as well. That's the other thing in educational settings. Technology has advanced so much it can really help us. But there's no real replacement for teaching those open communication skills, interacting with one another, holding a conversation, doing a presentation, working collaboratively in a community of people. Those are the things which uphold a, a successful society, a community. It's what makes us human. So those, that's one of my fears, I would say, concerns, you could say, with the advancement of, of AI. Oh, we should certainly um, work more. In fact, when my own children went back to school, it was funny after COVID, um, the teachers at the school did a wonderful presentation on how they realized that the things about school were not, the most important things about school were not the, the content of the academic uh, delivery in maths and science, you know, and English, but the opportunity for the children to come together, to share experiences, to play to share stories, to engage with each other. And those were the things that the children missed the most. They didn't say, I really missed that algebra. <laughs> they didn't, you know, they didn't say, and no offense to any mathematicians out there, <laughs> they didn't say, you know, I really miss the syntax in my, you know, the lexical lexicon in English language. They said, how wonderful it is to be reconnected again with my friends and my teachers. And the teachers said the same, how wonderful it is to see and be with the children. Mm. So it's one of the things that we should certainly be aware of as we move forward, for sure. So, Tom, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. So if if I was an athlete and I was to open up around my mental well-being and I was to approach you, um, what kind of things would you do in terms of your position? How, how would that play out? I'm intrigued to hear some of the practical um uh tools that you might use to support uh, young athletes or even older athletes in regards to mental well-being and um, because we've talked today around some of the things that are relevant you mentioned breathing um you mentioned levels of dopamine to some extent around digital technologies etc um people might be watching this and they might be inspired to maybe go into psychology what would the practice look like if um you were to kind of have a a client or a, an athlete or, or, or someone in, um, in a performance environment that might need dedicated support? Yeah, so I think one of the important things about this is that um, my role as a performance psychologist in sport is to understand the mental and emotional demands of that sport. 
And so they may say things like, um, I want to improve my capacity to focus under pressure. I want to improve my pre-performance routines, you know, to build that level of confidence before performance. I want to improve my ability to think less and flow more in training. And those things are very much performance based. So I think it's really important if we then go to speak about um, mental and emotional well-being, then then I have a, a clinical referral network that I work alongside in organizations that I'm in. And these are practitioners who provide a level of support, which are to do with the things that you're speaking about, right? Uh, boosting self-worth, um, taking care of our well-being, making sure that we are healthy and happy in our daily lives. Those are, whilst my role sort of inevitably works hand in hand with those practitioners, there is a difference. Um, so that's the first thing to say, that um, I would say that it's very important that organisations or anybody looking to get involved in working with athletes at a high level or in businesses or in education or whatever context we're speaking about, understand the difference in the, in the dedicated practitioner roles. Um, so it would be very common for me to work alongside the lifestyle practitioners, the mental health and well-being practitioners as part of the sports science and medicine departments in conjunction with them providing a service but I wouldn't necessarily provide that service myself. And that's one of the things I think we need to be um, careful of and mindful of as we as we specialize. But I guess it starts with understanding the differences, uh, at right, working right from the start. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think the, the, the alignment of, um, uh, of different team members kind of helps that process overall. Is that, is that what you're trying to emphasize? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're all sort of responsible for making sure that we're we're well and the yeah. well-being of our people are, are at the center and we can all do that together but i think it's also very important that the best organizations signpost those those roles very very well as mm. we spoke about earlier yeah and everybody understands the the difference uh, in the service delivery final part of the podcast tom what i normally get my guests to do is to reflect back or reflect or kind of look forward um, in relation to their career. I think what we've done over the, the last 45 minutes is reflect back, but I want to maybe think about psychology in the future and where you think it might go. You mentioned AI. I don't know if that might align with uh, some of the practices in the future, but uh, I'm intrigued to see where this goes because you mentioned there's a, there's a big emphasis on education. There's more awareness of um, psychological well-being and psychological practices. Where do you see this discipline moving to? And is there anything that kind of stands out in terms of your practices that might um, get you to think about how this might proceed in the future? That's a really great question. Um, well, there is a good book called The Future Coach. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> too early for the plug, too early. <laughs> no, I, I think... Um, Inevitably, as technology advances, we'll find ways to integrate technology into into helping athletes, coaches, managers, people uh, regulate, you know, themselves. Uh, and I think self-regulation is going to be a major part of the future of work in practice. I think also that the future um, of the work of of sports psychology in general will see themselves working and advancing to a role that sees them actively engaged with the leadership in each sporting organization that's pretty much here now but i still think we could be better at that i still think that's a major part of the future development of of organizations signposting the importance of this role and integrating that working practice themselves but also across the organization to demystify and debunk the stigma that's plagued the industry for for far too long yeah um so I think that's absolutely part part of the future. And then I would say that, you know, I was having a conversation with a, a sporting director the other day, and he mentioned in particular that in Premier League football clubs now, each player is becoming their own brand by their own right with clothing lines and um, a whole team of specialists around them is becoming more like the NFL in America every day. And so I think understanding that individual players within a team are going to have their own team in the future 
yeah. uh, not just uh, as you know strength and conditioning specialists and yoga teachers and meditation instructors but also sports psychologists performance psychologists so understanding that players are their own brands in general i'm using a football example now yeah. because their resources are a lot more than yeah. in other individual sports that they, they can choose who they want to work with and so clubs the successful clubs of the future will be those that best integrate the best services within their team for the individual players mm -hmm. within that playing squad and that's mm -hmm. going to be a big part of of the future the days of um sort of sidelining external practitioners are, are well gone because the best players have a, a team that they're working with outside of the team that they're working with so if we can best embrace um, knowledge and work in practice then i think that'll be ultimately a win-win for everybody uh, for the future you mentioned the future coach uh, your book do you want to maybe uh, give listeners uh or viewers a little bit of insight on that and how that book came about and um, how it might impact practice within the sporting discipline. Don't read it. It's rubbish. I know the author. <laughs> 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 oh, no, it was, a, it was a great joy to produce, really. It's about five years old now. And um, uh, no, I'm lying. It's 2017 the book was, was written and published. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a joy, really, because I guess you could say, you know, since 2007, I was writing the book um it's a it's a bank of a whole host of experiences and but, but i think the joy of the book and the feedback that i've got from coaches using it and reading it and working with it is that there are applied strategies inside yeah so if you're a coach wanting to get the best from your players there are real tools and techniques that you can pick up and use with your players every single day and oftentimes coaches are seeking these tools and strategies and techniques all the time that's what we do as practitioners always seeking to improve so yeah. it's a uh, it's told in a in a story type format, I guess you could say, but with practical um, exercises for coaches to pick up and use whatever level of player that you're working with at uh, any age range and gender. So it was a real joy to to produce. It's called The Future Coach, uh, Nine Principles from Sports Psychology. It's available on Amazon, I believe. And you can see more links uh, via my website, TomatesCoaching.com. What we'll do, Tom, is we'll put your link to the book as well as your website in the description so if anyone's listening or watching this they can click onto that and check that book out tom in terms of your work um where can where can people find you i presume you said trying to limit social media then i, I presume you've you've got a profile online where people might be able to to access some of your um content as well as um follow you and, and understand psychology a little bit more I, i'm intrigued on where you are within that um domain <laughs> yeah sure no 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 it's um and, and by the way social media can be very useful um yeah it's just you know too much of something <laughs> like anything can uh can cause us some issues that we don't really need or Absolutely, necessarily yeah. intend so i'm on social media yep you can find me on twitter tom bates coaching on instagram on youtube and there's a whole host of interviews and radio edits and television interviews that i've done over the years uh, my TEDx talk, Imagination and Creativity, uh, can also be found on the YouTube channel. And um, if you want to reach out professionally, you can either do that on the website, TomBatesCoaching.com, or uh, I believe that we were connected via via LinkedIn, or it might have been right, Instagram. So. Bit, a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is very effective. And uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to connect with Tom, by all means, feel free to follow those those pages um tom thank you for your time we really no enjoyed Before your conversation you go, yeah i'd love to ask you a question yeah please do yeah what what inspired you christy to start this podcast off what inspired me was i was in a situation um a social situation where i was around uh, former footballers and they had a lot to offer around um, their experiences but also they were very open about the culture of, of football and the culture uh, around their and how that impacted their mentality how it impacted their longevity within sport and I thought to myself why not format this in a way that is accessible um, and where people can learn and I think in terms of new media and new methods podcasting was a chosen avenue because of that 
Um, and since then, I've been very lucky to speak to former athletes, former football uh, managers, academics, practitioners. Um, and it's a little bit of a snowball effect, really. It's kind of uh, compounded and here I am speaking to you. So that's how the story came about. <laughs> well, the rest of the guests, I'm sure, have been useful for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, even you today has been very useful as well. So thank you for your time, Tom. <laughs> no, no problem. And last question. Where do you see this? Uh, how do you see the the impact and influence helping others? Because for sure it is because I've seen some of the previous podcasts yeah. and I really enjoyed them. So I'm not quite sure where it goes, but I do enjoy speaking to experts and practitioners and elite athletes, etc. cetera. Um, so it's more of an intrinsic drive rather than getting people to subscribe and monetize the the YouTube page from people have said, but I think it's more an inner feeling of, I've just been able to have that opportunity and being very lucky to, to speak to people. You mentioned gratitude. I think that's kind of key term there as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my outlook towards it. And if it can be consistent, you never know where it might go. <laughs> Absolutely. Christy, well, listen, if there's anything <laughs> that I can do to help you on that journey, you know, let's stay connected and, um, some fantastic questions that you've asked me today. So Absolutely. it was a real pleasure to be with you.